Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I think uh, we will get started, if that's fine. Um, so let me actually uh, begin by, first of all, uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, our four Australian campuses stand, and we'd like to pay uh, our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, my name is uh, Gaurav Dutt, and on behalf of the Center for Development Economics and Sustainability, uh, I'm, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to this webinar on the Indian economy, uh, 75 years since independence. Um, so as you know, uh, 2022 uh, marks 75 years of India's independence, and, and some of us at CDS thought uh, that it's only befitting to, to observe the occasion by organizing uh, an event around it. And what we have ended up doing is actually organizing a double header. So we have, in fact, uh, two webinar events. So the first one on the Indian economy, which is the, today's event, and the other one uh, is on India's history uh, uh, on November 3rd uh, with uh, the eminent historian, uh, Professor Romila Thapar. So we are looking forward to that event too. Um, so, um, so, you know, perhaps uh, 75 years is uh, probably not a, a long time in the life of a nation or her economy. Uh, but I think it's long enough to, for us to take stock. And uh, if I may invoke the, the, the famous words of uh, India's first prime minister on the eve of uh, India's independence, uh, it's, it, it's, it, we could ask the question whether, uh, uh, whether we are successful in, uh, in, in redeeming the pledges that we had made, as he said, uh, not in full measure, but very substantially. Uh, but also, you know, beyond just uh, assessing how far we have come, uh, I think it's equally, if not more important, to also ask uh, what lies ahead and uh, what are the emerging challenges and priorities for the Indian economy. And in some ways, I hope, you know, that's uh, a theme we'll be able to explore today. So um, to help us do that, um, we actually are very fortunate to have a, a very distinguished set of uh, guests today, and it's my pleasure to introduce them briefly. So to kick off our discussion, first of all, uh, we have Professor Arvind Subramanian from Brown University and the Peterson Institute for International Economics. So Arvind, uh, as you know, has uh, had a very long and distinguished career, uh, including his uh, work at the GATT, the IMF, where he was the assistant director of research. And he's uh, had visiting professorships at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, Johns Hopkins University, Ashoka University, and I'm sure I'm missing some. And uh, perhaps most significantly from the perspective of uh, today's uh, proceedings, uh, as the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India uh, from October 2014 to July 2018. And, um, and the economic surveys of India, uh, which were produced uh, under his stewardship as the CEA, uh, truly they have been a hard act to follow. Uh, and if I may actually just quote uh, Avijit Banerjee, as he put it, Arvind did something remarkable to the stodgy world of institutional research. And, uh, and I think that certainly stands true. Uh, and, and for instance, you know, the 2018 economic survey, some of you may know, it was a wildly popular document with 20 million views uh, from across 190 countries in the very first year of its publication. Um, the list of uh, Professor Subramanian's uh, publications and writings, both academic, as well as popular ones, is, uh, is probably as long as it's influential. And um, I will just note that you know, he's uh, currently in the top 1% of the world's most cited academic economists. And according to the Foreign Policy magazine, uh, one of the world's top 100 global thinkers. And, and quite frankly, there is 
hardly an issue of uh, you know india's economic policy on which uh, arvin's uh, council has not been influential so we are very fortunate indeed to have uh, arvin join us today so welcome arvin also uh, joining us is uh, professor jayati ghosh uh, from the university of massachusetts uh, who has also been a, a keen and untiring commentator on the Indian economy for a long period of time. Uh, Professor Ghosh has taught economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi for more than three decades prior to uh, her move to Amherst in January 2021. Um, she's authored uh, a large number of books or edited a large number of books and written more than 200 uh, scholarly articles as she's received numerous prizes, including the 2015 uh, the Sheya Award for uh, Distinguished Contributions uh, to the Social Sciences in India, uh, the International Labour Organization's 2011 award or prize for uh, called the Decent Work Research Prize, and, and the 2010 Italian North Sud Prize for Social Sciences. And in uh, March 2022, she uh, has was also appointed to the U UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. And in fact, she's just returned from Kenya in relation to that. So I'm glad that we are, she's able to join us. Jayati, of course, is a prolific writer and uh, has been contributing regularly to uh, the popular media as well, including newspapers, journals, as well as blogs. So welcome, Jayati. And last but not the least, uh, we have Dr. Shekhar Shah from the Indian School of Public Policy, uh, where he's the vice chair of their Academic Advisory Council. And uh, Shekhar actually also is an advisor uh, to our uh, center's advisory board. Uh, and Shekhar is, of course, an old friend, uh, but he's also a long-time scholar and policy analyst uh, uh, for South Asian economies. And uh, he was the Director General of the National Council of Applied Economic Research in India in New Delhi for 10 years, uh, a tenure that he just finished in 2021. And before that, he's had a, a long and uh, varied and distinguished career at the World Bank serving many different uh, positions as the Regional Economic Advisor for South Asia, a Deputy Research Administrator, uh, the Lead Economist for Bangladesh, and then the list goes on. And he was also one of the principal authors of the 2004 World Development Report uh, on making services work for the poor. Um, I should also make a mention of the India Policy Forum uh, hosted by NCAER, which has been really a, a, one of the most prominent annual events on uh, India's policy conference, economic policy conference calendar, and indeed has contributed uh, enormously to public discussion of uh, important and topical policy issues. So, um, <laughs> I mean, these introductions could go much longer, but in the interest of time, let me stop here and uh, welcome all the all our uh, speakers and our, our guests and the audience. And uh, uh, before I just uh, pass on the, uh, the, 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 the virtual floor to Professor Subramanian, uh, uh, let me just uh, mention briefly uh, a word about the format. So we'll begin with, uh, with Professor Subramanian, uh, who will uh, probably speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll turn to uh, Jayati and Shekhar for their comments and their own perspective and their takes on the Indian economy at 75. Um, and we hope uh, this will be followed by uh, a vibrant Q&A session. And uh, for the audience, uh, please uh, use the Q&A feature in, this, uh, in Zoom to send us your questions and we'll do our very best to accommodate as many as possible. So without further ado, uh, uh, 
over to Professor Subramanian, who's um, never shy of controversy, but always stimulating. Professor Subramanian. Um, th th thanks, uh, 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 Gaurav, uh, uh, and, and your center for inviting me uh, to come today and uh, be part of such a distinguished panel. Um, I'm really looking forward to, you know, hearing all of you and getting your comments. So, um, you know, as you said, Gaurav, you know, this is about 75 years. We need to take stock, but, uh, but we also need to look ahead. Uh, so what I thought I would do is to do a, a, a brief presentation, uh, abbreviate uh, the past into three or four slides and, and do violent injustice to, you know, uh, the, the Indian, the rich Indian economic history and then focus very much on the present uh, moment and you know what's happening. And then uh, uh, I'm sure Jyoti and Shekhar will have uh, uh, very insightful things to say about uh, you know, lots of things, including future challenges, uh, which I will not you know, go into much detail. Uh, uh, so so uh, let, let me just begin by uh, um, you know, uh, abbreviating India's economic history into into say four slides, um, you know, just to give a sense of first India's growth, you know, first 30 years, uh, weak growth of about one and a half percent per capita. Then the period after 1980, which, you know, Danny, uh, uh, Roderick and I called, you know, pro-business reforms when India's growth takes off. Uh, then we have the kind of neoliberal reforms after the crisis of 1991, growth surges until, uh, uh, the global financial crisis, and thereafter growth slows down one again. So basically, you know, um, a, a bookending uh, two periods of kind of relatively modest performance. Uh, India sizzled for about thirty to thirty-five years, uh, uh, and and uh, you know, that's kind of a brief economic history of what happened. Um, I, and this is uh, I put this up not just to you know pay tribute to Gaurav's terrific work. Um, but actually, this, in, this uh, chart has actually influenced me quite a bit, uh, which is kind of a similar history of poverty reduction in India. A and what you find is that for the first 30 years, uh, poverty was kind of stagnant and high. A and then once growth takes off in, in the 80s, it starts uh, declining uh, and then uh, sharply falls You know, uh, after 91. A and I've drawn... Uh, after 2011, you know, there is no uh, survey, but basically we think, uh, you know, poverty reduction has been pretty modest, uh, 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 if at all, uh, but that's the subject of the poverty 2.0 debate that's raging uh, currently. But, but broadly, a delayed but tangible progress on poverty reduction. Um, I want to stress two aspects of India's economic development that I think have really been um, you know, the, the, the pledge is not fulfilled, as it were, of what to use uh, uh, Gaurav, you know, Gaurav channeling Pandit Nehru. You know, this is a chart which shows on the y-axis what is India's share of low-skilled manufacturing exports, and on the x-axis, India's share of uh, the working age uh, population, uh, uh, and this is confined to non-advanced economies. So essentially, the rough intuition is that, you know, if you have a lot of relatively unskilled labor, you should be exporting a lot of relatively unskilled uh, uh, goods. And what you find is that, you know, startlingly, uh, India and China are outliers. This line is the 45 degree line. And India has about 22 to 23 percent of the, uh, you know, working age population of the world. Uh, it has less than 5% of uh, global low-skill exports. China, on the other hand, similar share of working age population, but close to 40% of uh, So essentially what this shows in one chart is that India's uh, uh, you know, development over 75 years has not been very good to uh, employment and to utilizing its vast uh, you know, endowments of uh, relatively unskilled labor. So, so in a sense, this has been uh, a, a, one of the disappointments of India's economic performance. Uh, it's been labor underutilizing and kind of defying India's comparative advantage. Um, last chart on economic history. I, I think it would be fair to say that where we've really, I think, uh, 
not redeemed our pledge is in human uh, capital formation. Uh, I call this the failed uh, Foule uh, transformation uh, uh, because if you look at you know the makers of modern India, arguably uh, uh, you know uh, the the people who were most obsessed with spreading education uh, to uh, especially to the you know oppressed caste and to to women uh, were Jyotira Phule uh, and his wife Savitri Bai Phule. I mean they were activists. Uh, uh, who, who really invested a lot of effort uh, in spreading education. And what this chart shows is that basically uh, on the left-hand side, uh, I want you to focus on South Asia, which is broadly India. Uh, literacy has gone up uh, sharply for women, steadily for men uh, on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, what it shows is that conditional on being in, in, in grade five, actually uh, expected literacy has actually declined over time. So what it's saying is that, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, India's improvement in literacy to the extent there's been is because of actually getting people to school, kids to school, but once in school, learning outcomes have, if anything, deteriorated over time. This has been true of education. It's also been true of health. So in that sense, I think what stands out um, and if you look at India's ranking today on the Human Development Index, it's something like 132 or 188 countries, which I think is, is a pretty disappointing performance uh, for what we set out to do uh, on this. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot more one we can talk about, uh, but I just thought I'd give a brief uh, you know, history and then fast forward you know, 70, 75 years to the present moment. And, and it seems like if, you, if the present moment is the whole world looking east, but looking east in particular to India. You know, uh, The Economist a couple of months ago had a cover saying, is this India's moment? Michael Spence, the Nobel Prize laureate says, this is kind of India's the outstanding performer. The IMF's managing director uh, and lots of other people are gushing about India. And of course, uh, Apple has said, uh, it's, it's actually begun making the iPhone 14 in India, marking a big shift in its manufacturing strategy. So, so the two questions of the moment that I will address today uh, are, you know, why is India the flavor du jour of the moment? Why is everyone gushing about India? And is it a uh, second question? Is it is it warranted? Uh, I think the reason why India seems to be uh, uh, everyone's gushing about India is there seems to be a kind of relative dimension to it. <clears throat> even within South Asia, you know, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, even Bangladesh, which until recently was the you know kind of development darling, has uh, you know is negotiating a program with the IMF. A relative haven of uh, of stability, economic stability, relative uh, 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 haven. Um, then, of course, the, re the other relative dimension is that, you know, she's China is spiraling downwards. Uh, any, uh, you know, reasonable forecast for China is now two and a half to three percent over the medium term. Uh, and so compared to China, India is starting to look uh, much better. Uh, it has a, a stable, it has a young population, it has a talented uh, a workforce. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's what seems to be one reason why India is catching people's attention. Then, of course, the new opportunities are being created. China uh, has started becoming uncompetitive, uh, you know, as a result of doing well. In fact, you know, uh, Shomitra Chatterjee and I calculate that from uh, after the global financial crisis, China, just by virtue of becoming successful, raising wages, raising productivity, uh, has lost about $150 billion worth of uh, exports to other countries. That's an opportunity potentially for India. The uh, COVID pandemic has favored services over manufacturing. And of course, post Ukraine, uh, the world capital is looking for alternatives uh, to China, Russia, especially to China. And the Apple iPhone announcement uh, is to a large extent, you know, kind of symptomatic of, of uh, a big capital, big foreign direct investment turning away from China, and India starts looking like uh, a reasonable, uh, viable alternative. I think the other reason why I think India is, is in the news 
I think there have been some legitimate, what I would call hardware achievements. What do I mean by hardware? I think since the late 1990s, uh, India's state has shown this capacity to deliver at scale. Uh, uh, it began with uh, you know, the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, the quadrilateral program. Uh, so, so there are kind of four components to this hardware, I would say. One, infrastructure construction has kind of grown quite rapidly. And there's a chart here which shows, you know, uh, this is just you know, roll, uh, road, uh, road kilometers, rail kilometers, a steady increase uh, since the late 1990s. Uh, then, of course, under the UPA, we saw state capacity manifesting itself uh, in terms of creating social safety nets. You know, Mandrega, uh, the National Food Security Act, the various rights, you know, uh, rights based approach to education uh, and other spheres. And of course, Aadhaar was begun uh, under uh, uh, that government as well. So uh, the second hardware achievement, if it were, was the creation of a social safety net, um, which has stood India in very good stead in the last few years. <coughs> a third dimension, which I would call the kind of new welfareism, um, uh, Narendra Modi style, has not been so much you know, uh, provision of health and education or indeed a social safety net, but kind of a new approach to, to welfare, what we earlier in the 70s and 80s, one might have called the basic needs approach uh, to development. Essentially, it consists of, you know, the public provision of essential private goods and services like toilets, cooking gas, bank accounts, housing, cash, and now water. Uh, and if you look at the NFHS data on the left-hand side, the share of households with access to benefits ha has gone up uh, uh, quite substantially uh, since about 2005. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see similarly, direct benefit transfers, cash have gone up short up very sharply. So uh, this, is a, this is a kind of uh, 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 manifestation of this, what I call the new welfareism. What is very distinctive about this new welfareism is that it's the delivery of attributable tangibles. You know, it, it's, it's stuff, uh, 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 those are the tangibles, uh, and you know the government makes sure uh, that people know who is providing these tangibles, so it's attributable to uh, uh, you know uh, the government and the prime minister. Uh, I think the last aspect of this hardware achievement is you know uh, what I would call the, you know the pub the provision uh, public provision of a uh, open source access platform, digital platform which that's why I call it part of the hardware, um, uh, which is kind of in the last uh, four or five years, uh, given rise to this buzz of the digital and FinTech revolution, a lot of finance and entrepreneurship has gone into it. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is a chart showing how many unicorns have been created both in uh, dollars and in numbers. And you see there's been a steady increase you know, $350 billion worth of unicorns, about 100 unicorns. Um, uh, uh, I, I like to joke that the digital revolution, you know, uh, we're, we're creating a lot of uh, unicorns, but we're creating chess grandmasters probably at a faster pace than we are unicorns. But it's kind of emblematic of how the digital revolution is creating pockets of, you know, uh, creativity and buzz and entrepreneurship and, you know, applications and so on. But I want to emphasize and keep for you to keep in mind uh, the notion of a pocket, because this is not kind of uh, something that's uh, spreading a lot of prosperity uh, to the rest of the economy. Uh, so, so they're the hardware achievements. Uh, 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 and so uh, the next question. So uh, India is looking good because uh, of the relative scene. Uh, it's looking good because of some real achievements. Uh, the question is, is this warranted? Uh, is all this buzz about India warranted? Uh, I want to first begin by uh, uh, considering recent economic performance. Uh, if you go back to the uh, you know start of the century of this millennium, uh, essentially between you know 2002 and 2011, uh, uh, and, and this started uh, earlier, India was just growing gangbusters, and you see the black uh, bars, which shows annual average growth in real terms, uh, and you can see all the major macro indicators, investment, exports, imports, credits were growing gangbusters. 
after the global financial crisis around 2011, uh, you know, things start turning south, things start turning sour in India. And that's why you see almost every major macroeconomic indicator, uh, you know, decline uh, very sharply. So that's when the growth slowdown begins, basically after the global financial crisis. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, people kind of have forgotten that uh, uh, whereas COVID was a big shock that hit India, in fact, in 2019-20, there was a, you know, a pre-COVID shock because of two major financial shocks. India had a kind of mini Lehman moment uh, in 2018 with two major financial companies going under. And essentially in 2019-20, you know, the economy collapsed even before COVID. Uh, and all these, you know, similar indicators, all in negative growth territory. And then, of course, COVID uh, uh, hit the economy. But I think, uh, and now we, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the buzz about India is because, you know, we're seeing growth rates of, you know, double digit, 13, 14, 15% growth rates in some quarters. That's giving rise to all this euphoria about India. But I think you have to remember that uh, when we evaluate COVID and its aftermath, we have to be a bit careful because, you know, uh, there were big declines and then, uh, you know, things are basically, you know, could just be reflecting those declines. So sure, it's a simple chart. I can, we can have many, many other indicators, but essentially, if you benchmark it to the pre-COVID year, uh, you see the red line is GDP. Nine quarters after, uh, 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 later, you know, after the decline of COVID and the recovery, the economy is only about four percent bigger uh, uh, than it was nine quarters before. So, so the reco the recovery from COVID, despite the export boom, because in the last two years exports have really done very very well because of the U.S. fiscal stimulus and so on, but despite all of that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the recovery has been fairly weak, I would say very feeble. So if you put all these things together, a uh, uh, big slowdown after the global financial crisis, two major financial shocks even before COVID, and then COVID hits, you recover, but the recovery is fairly weak. Uh, and, you know, I've shown a, a chart on two wheelers just to sh give you a sense of, you know, a broader based consumption uh, demand. And what you see is that, uh, you know, the labor market has been very weak for a long time. On the left-hand side, this is CMIE data. This is my preferred measure of, of the labor market, which is the employment population ratio. Uh, it's been on a steady decline, secular decline for a long time. And Manrega demand has been pretty high. Uh, e even into this recovery, it's been pretty high on the right-hand side. Uh, now. A year ago, uh, you know, I would have told this similar story, but now what has happened is this: on top of this relatively weak recovery, you know, a slowdown, a long-term slowdown, a huge financial shock, a huge COVID shock, recovery from that, uh, suddenly we also have the return of macroeconomic challenges. Uh, this is a chart which shows Indian uh, CPI inflation. For the last 36 months, inflation has been above uh, the RBI central target of 4%, and for about 60% of the time, it's been above 6%, which is the ceiling for the RBI. And uh, uh, just to be emphasize something, India had a high inflation problem even before the lockdown, even before COVID, and it has a high inflation problem well into the recovery uh, after COVID as well. So, so, so the macroeconomic challenges have returned, inflation has come back, but most worryingly, India's, I think, uh, fiscal situation is in pretty uh, 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 difficult uh, shape. Um, normally, I would show you the, you know, the, the, the deficit, India's deficit is close to double digit. But what I want to focus on here is something that's quite unique about India. Uh, on the left hand side, you have uh, interest to revenue. Uh, on the right hand set of charts, you have interest to expenditure. And India is just off the charts uh, on this. So India's interest revenue ratio is about 40% now, and interest to expenditure ratio is about 20%. And it's well above, uh, you know, even Brazil, which is meant to be meant to be the most uh, one of the most vulnerable, fiscally vulnerable uh, countries. What this shows is that 
you know, we're running such high deficits that just paying interest uh, is absorbing a huge fraction of revenue. And it's it's accounting for a large share of expenditure, leaving very uh, that much less for all other much more uh, socially productive expenditures. So the fiscal problem in India is getting uh, has deteriorated quite rapidly. I'm showing this for the center, but actually at the level of the states, it's also very bad. This is a chart uh, based on some calculations we've done. Just the discom losses uh, for the uh, at the state government level are about now one and a half percent of GDP and, and and probably deteriorating if accounted for probably. So not only is the central government fiscal situation a uh, slightly tricky, uh, so is is the fiscal situation of the states. So inflation has come back. The fiscal situation is quite powerless. The external situation. Situation has gotten a bit dicey as well, but India has reserves still of about, despite having spent, uh, some people think India has spent about 100 to 110 billion in forward and spot market uh, uh, intervention by the RBI to prevent the decline of the rupee. So, so the external situation uh, uh, on a flow basis is a bit dicey, but we still have a lot of reserves uh, to cushion against external shocks. But overall, the macro strategy, uh, 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 macro challenges have returned. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, uh, interim conclusions, the headlines flatter to deceive. There's been a slowdown after the global financial crisis, uh, two shocks, a feeble recovery, and uh, macro challenges have returned just as the global economy is weakening. Now, stepping back a little bit, I think uh, I want to emphasize that, you know, Opportunities are growing, as I showed, you know, the whole, uh, I think, especially the globalization opportunities for India are increasing, especially with the geopolitical shifts. As I've shown, the hardware uh, uh, in terms of infrastructure, digital and physical is improving. And the sole basic needs come social safety net, you know, first began under UPA, taken a different form under uh, the Modi government has been strengthened. But among all the many challenges that loom for India, uh, I think the growth and the employment challenges loom very, very large uh, going forward. Uh, you've seen um, what the employment population ratio, uh, I could show you charts on informality. Informality is still very high in India. So I think how do you get you know, employment intensive growth uh, is going to be, you know, apart from the environmental challenge uh, and the other social challenges, uh, I think these are going to loom large for India. Now, uh, what is the kind of government strategy for these growth and employment challenges? Uh, uh, I, I think I'm going to focus and, and end on two things. One is kind of uh, the government's, you know, you can piece together its new strategy, which is kind of self-reliance. And that consists of on the external side, uh, 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 an increase in protectionism. Tariffs have gone up, Shomitra Chatchin have calculated, by about five to six percentage points, affecting 70% of imports. And on the external side, we've also decided to disengage from trade arrangements, especially in Asia. There's talk now of a free trade agreement with the UK. We don't know how that will go. But basically, on the external side, uh, there is, a, 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 you know, a, a turn inward, quite a market turn inward, repudiating 30 years of a consensus in favor of slow, steady opening. On the internal side, uh, there's, uh, uh, for the first time, really, India has embarked on aggressive industrial policy uh, and a policy of promoting national champions. So, 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 if you if you put together these four components of the new strategy of self reliance protectionism disengagement from trade arrangements on the internal side industrial policy and promoting national champions uh, you know we uh, we can talk about that in the q and a but the promoting national champions has to be has to worry one because we know I, i've you know called this uh, josh Feldman and i call this you know the 2a variant of stigmatized capitalism you know some groups are being favored uh, quite markedly uh, and um, uh, you know the robber barons in the us uh, were uh, got a lot of regulatory favors the chai bowls of korea got a lot of regulatory favors but i think 
two distinctive things about these national champions in India. Uh, one, of course, their scope of operation is absolutely octopus-like uh, in terms of its reach across the economy. The robber barons of, uh, of yesteryear and, and, and even the Bezos's and, and Elon Musk's of today are basically one or two trick ponies, whereas these national champions, their reach is actually pretty wide in the economy, which should make us pause about whether this promoting is good. The second thing is that unlike the Chabols, for example, that were, uh, uh, that were also promoted, uh, those were mostly in tradable goods industries where at least uh, they had to pass the market test of export discipline. Uh, in the Indian case, many of them uh, uh, operate in non-tradable, heavily regulated sectors with regulatory favors. Uh, and therefore, one has to wonder how this will uh, play out and one has to be watchful and skeptical of anything. So, so this... Uh, so. And also this industrial policy is not really gain, uh, uh, aimed at uh, labor intensive industries. It's all very capital intensive, skill intensive industries. So the challenge of, you know, employment intensive growth, it's not obvious that, you know, if, if you're going to do it uh, away from India's comparative advantage, favoring, uh, uh, you know, skill intensive sectors, favoring national champions, uh, turning away from uh, uh, an export strategy, it's not clear whether this strategy would work. But the second component of, you know, one is the government strategy and one is, you know, the kind of affect of the government, the disposition. Um, and here, uh, you know, we have a piece in foreign policy, Josh Feldman and I, where we say that this, you know, one way of kind of capturing this is to say that there's something basically missing in the software of economic policy making. And by software, we mean various things like, you know, is the le playing field level for all investors, you know, domestic and foreign, and not just a favored few, as I just spoke about. Is decision making, uh, uh, you know, non-arbitrary? Is it inclusive? And we saw in the pandemic and the farm laws, uh, unlike with the GST, which was very inclusive, uh, uh, um, the pandemic and farm laws and other instances, uh, it, it's been more centralized decision making. Um, Policy stability, I think uh, it's fair to say that, you know, on the one hand with agriculture, uh, farm incomes are, are promised to be double, but then at the drop of a hat, you know, export restrictions are imposed. The tax regime similarly yo-yos between, you know, bringing people into the tax net and, you know, keeping them out. Uh, something that I've written about data integrity and transparency are kind of missing. Uh, we saw that with the GDP numbers, the poverty numbers, the employment numbers, uh, uh, and of course, the elephant in the room that, you know, it's beyond my pay grade to talk about, you know, whether, you know, uh, 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 a country needs social cohesion uh, to create, I mean, it's important, of course, in itself, but also to create a broader climate uh, for, uh, you know, uh, a broader climate that, you know, investors can have confidence in. So, so the government's response, current response to these big challenges of growth and employment uh, uh, one's reaction uh, or at least instinct would have to be to be skeptical, uh, but, may, you know, but to be open, maybe, you know, it can work. But the initial involuntary reaction is one of skepticism, whether this would work, because the uh, the, the self-reliance strategy, it's not obvious that, you know, especially, uh, you know, the four pillars of that, whether they're going to be helpful. And of course, the broader uh, software of economic policy making. So I think my own conclusion in terms of looking ahead in terms of India's ability to, uh, uh, you know, address these serious challenges uh, of employment and growth uh, 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 at this stage, given where we are, given the macro challenges, given everything else, uh, would be uh, one of, uh, you know, uh, skepticism and even a bit of anxiety rather than the kind of gung-ho optimism that seems to characterize uh, uh, people's views about India today. Uh, so so uh, let me end on that note, you know, uh, uh, and uh, look forward to hearing what others have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Gaurav. Well, thanks a lot, Arvind. Uh, as usual, a large canvas uh, covering a lot of ground and um, 
and 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 a lot of food for thought and a lot of things uh, others can chew on and uh, ending on a note of skepticism and anxiety um uh with with some shades of optimism if i may put it like that so um, um over to jayadi uh, we'd be eager to hear um, your thoughts thank you very much and uh, thank you Arvind for a, a typically insightful illuminating presentation and I think you, you've captured so many elements of both the long run pattern and the more recent context and likely trajectory so I'm going to stick to your format in a sense I'm going to talk a little bit about the long run and I I completely agree with you on many of these issues I would argue that in a sense, you know, uh, for me, the most fundamental failure of the Indian Development Project, if you like, over the 75 years, has really been the lack of sufficient structural transformation. Uh, to me, that's the big story, that there's really this in broader inability to move people from lower value added activities to higher value added activities. Uh, unlike, let's say, China, unlike a bunch of other countries that are now seen as successes. And in a sense, that is a kind of original sin that also then perhaps explains some of the other things that you mentioned, the, the poor human development indicators, the, you know, of course, other aspects of our discriminatory uh, tendencies like caste have played an important role in that. But I think the, the poor employment generation in particular, it's not just that we're not moving people out, but overall inadequate gen employment generation that you mentioned, I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think what's remarkable about India is that this is a trajectory that has persisted through the Nehruvian deregist regimes, through the subsequent economic uh, liberalization period of you know, neoliberal reforms, through the more recent period. In other words, it persists through all of these different types of economic regime. And so it says something about the nature of our particular form of capitalist development. So in a way, yes, we have terrible human development indicators, but it's, it's really this, if you like, critical feature of uh, employment generation, which is not to say that we are not utilizing a large part of our labor force, we are, but that we are not employing them and we're certainly not employing them in what are the proper sort of formal jobs, the, the modern jobs that people thought would come with the process of industrialization. So first of all, we haven't had enough industrialization or moves to other more value added sectors sufficiently. And more significantly, we haven't been able to shift our labor force into those areas. Critically, our uh, use of women's labor, I think, is something that we really have to note because, again, it's unusual. India is one of the few countries in the world where we've had relatively rapid rates of GDP growth of, you know, excess of 7%, between 7 and 10% for a reasonable length of time. And yet women's workforce participation fell. That is, women's recognized employment fell. It didn't mean that less that uh, less women were working. It simply meant that less women were employed or recognized as working. And if you look at the NSS labor force surveys, you realize that a significant part of this is really women involved in or what are known quaintly as household duties, uh, Code 92 and Code 93, which is household duties plus other uh, associated activities like fetching water, fetching fuel, wood, kitchen gardening, poultry raising, etc cetera, etc cetera. so the use of women in unpaid form has been a very important part of our economic trajectory especially since the 1990s if you look at the aggregate labor force surveys officially only about 18 percent of women of 15 plus are employed uh, are working so-called but if you look at the other activities that are embodied in code 92 and code 93 uh, then 85% of women are working. And a very large part of them are in Code 93, are in the household duties plus extended SNA activities. And 42% of those SN extended SNA activities are in critical things like fetching water and fet fetching fuel wood, without which these households would not survive. It is true, we hope, 
that some of the recent changes in terms of you know access to uh, to by, uh, to cooking gas and uh, extension of water etc should reduce that it hasn't so far the labor force su survey suggests that it hasn't really reduced the time women spend or the number of women who are spending time in these unpaid labor activities so in a way uh, the the absence of dramatic shifts in employment and in, in structural transformation is is if you like the the original sin of of the entire period then we get this high growth phase which you mentioned that yes definitely it was a much higher growth phase and then the decade after that we had a low growth phase but this high growth phase itself when you when you think of it in more disaggregated terms around half of that is in extractive industries it's in you know, exploiting the mineral base of the of the economy, and another half you could argue is really the result of a, a particular type of demand uh, that emerges from, let's say, the top hundred uh, million of the population or the top 10, 15 percent of the population, as a result of the opening up of financial uh, markets, which makes India this hot destination for a brief time enables uh, you know dramatically increases liquidity and credit access for a huge range of households and thereby creates a particular boom confined to a relatively small part of the population i mean it's still a large number because 100 million 150 million is still a large number but it's a small part of our population in a way you could argue that one of the defining features therefore of the indian development process has been exclusion of a very large part of the population from the benefits. And that is then expressed in all those other things that you mentioned, you know, the poor health and education indicate. I think you didn't mention health, but you know, clearly on health, we're terrible, right? We're out there in nutrition, we're out there among the worst performing countries in the world. And uh, education, where our performance has been way below even comparator countries like Bangladesh. So um, what explains this exclusion? And, and I have argued in the past that it's not just, you know, that, okay, these people got left out of the growth process. It's not really that. It's in, it is an exclusion through incorporation. It's, it is peasants are incorporated into market processes that work to their disadvantage. Uh, people, indigenous peoples, uh, the so-called tribal populations, are incorporated into processes that displace them because they are seen as living on land that is rich in minerals or forests or other resources. Um, women are integrated into market processes which rely more and more on their unpaid labor and force them into more and more unpaid labor rather than paid employment. Uh, segmented labor markets, which are critically dependent on both gender and caste, have been crucial in enabling that kind of extraction. And, and so even in the phase of high growth, it was one that actually relied on these very unfortunate uh, tendencies, legacies, uh, characteristics of Indian society and political economy with, which enabled that kind of exclusion. Okay, in that boy backdrop, then what about the, the recent tendencies? And you know, here I think you were, as usual, uh, predictably, remarkably balanced, and you know, you gave the whole glass half full, glass half empty kinds of discussion, and and I agree again with with most of that. But I would highlight some other aspects uh, which I think are particularly important in the recent period. Yes, you mentioned that we have a very large fiscal deficit and a large public debt at the moment, uh, or increasing public debt at the moment, not really large by by international standards at the moment, but certainly increasing. But I think what is most remarkable in, especially the last few years, in the last three or four years, is that we experienced, first of all, the slowdown that you mentioned, and then this very dramatic collapse driven by a, a very draconian lockdown and, and subsequent closures because of the pandemic with very little social protection. I mean, I think you talked about how it's increased, but it is still extremely little. And again, by global standards, we are one of the worst performers in terms of social protection during the pandemic. According to the ILO, I think we are 34th from the bottom or something in terms of you know the kind, the per capita provision of social protection. But more importantly, this 
pandemic came, as you mentioned, uh, after a period of already, you know, when the economy was already flailing, it was not really doing well. So it's an economy that already has comorbidities, if you like, on which you get this dramatic uh, closure of activities. And that has negative multiplier effects, which are persisting to this day. We haven't had NSS consumption surveys. We, the one that we did have, the data was suppressed, but uh, the leaked document suggests that rural consumption had declined very significantly by 2017-18, and uh, even urban consumption had not recovered, uh, had, had not grown sufficiently to compensate for that. So there was a real problem of mass consumption demand. The labor force surveys that we do have, insofar as you can glean something about consumption from those, it tells us that mass consumption demand is declining, it's falling. In an economy which with now the kinds of recovery that, that you mentioned. So there is a real problem of inadequate domestic demand, especially mass consumption demand. And that necessarily has to feed into investment plans, into all of these other things. So, so you have, for example, a big a giveaway of taxes in order to further corporate investment that, that happened in 2018, 2019. And you don't get that increase in investment. You don't get the expected response of corporate investors because in fact, you know, the market is not there. There isn't a sufficient um, availability of domestic demand to enable, to enable that increase in investment. You get, um, well, I mean, uh, I won't say agrarian distress exactly in the same form that we have talked about, but there is no doubt significant concern about the viability of agriculture, the, the profitability of cultivation. And the farmers' protests, we have to remind ourselves that yes, the big, uh, very evident protest was the one that uh, occurred in response to the proposed farm laws and you know the very ultimately effective attempt to prevent those farm laws from being, being enacted. But before that, there had been huge farmers' protests across the whole country. There had been a major march to parliament from all over India. There were big protests in Maharashtra, in Bengal, in Orissa, in Tamil Nadu. In other words, there were farmers' protests at their conditions and at the lack of viability, the financial viability of farming was under threat. Um, we have had, as I said, you know, supposedly we were going to enter a period of a demographic dividend we are instead uh, sitting on a ticking time bomb because we have more and more people entering the labor force without, forget good jobs, without any jobs for them. Uh, and then finally, over this period in particular, we have seen an, a degree of fiscal centralization, which I think is not just hugely problematic, it's dangerous because a country like India, I don't think can survive as a, as a unified country without some significant degree of decentralization and fiscal federalism. I think that has been an essential part of, uh, of Indian unity in a way. And so the attempt at extreme centralization uh, of decision-making and of resources, while nonetheless leaving the state governments to sort of deal with the fallout of those centralized decisions, which is really what happened during the pandemic, is one that has huge costs. You mentioned that states are facing fiscal problems. One of the large reasons for that is that they had to bear a lot of the costs of dealing with the pandemic. And they were forced to then take on debt to deal with it rather than given what they had been promised in terms of the compensation, uh, the compensatory revenues after the GST was announced. You know, the, the difference between 14% increase and what they actually received in taxes. Uh, which they didn't receive, and instead they were basically allowed to borrow more, which has left all of them with lar larger debts. Finally, I would just like to mention the private debt in India. So everyone always looks at the public debt as, as a source of concern, but you know, private debt has been ballooning. Private external debt, private domestic debt. And a large part of that we know now is extremely fragile. Uh, among the biggest debtors is in fact, um, one of those whom I think you very uh, um, beautifully described as a sort of national champion being promoted, or let's just call it a crony capitalist, or you know, <laughs> with fingers in many pies, uh, one of the two A's. Uh, this is enormous debt, and it is because it is in so many so many sectors, and because it is so fragile, 
If it comes down, it would take significant sectors of the economy with it. So I think that's another potential time bomb that we have to think about. Uh, the increasingly unviable debt, which is held not just by state governments and, and the central government, but increasingly by private players, which can have a extreme contagion impact, as we know from many other cases. So there's a lot to be worried about in, in terms of the immediate future. Does it mean that you know it's all lost and disaster awaits us? Well, it could. I, I'm, I can't deny the possibility that disaster awaits. Also, because we know that climate change is already impacting our country and it's already impacting people and creating climate refugees and creating the potential for very large disasters and affecting our agriculture and doing all of these things. And we are not putting aside the resources or spending the resources that are required to deal with adaptation. I mean, forget mitigation, to deal with adaptation. We're not spending the required amounts. On the other hand, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I was fortunate in, in Cambridge to be taught by Joan Robinson, and she had this wonderful saying about India. She said, whatever you can say about India, the opposite is also true. And to some extent, I think that's the case, that you know, whenever things become so extreme and, and so dire, other things happen that make you realize that uh, you know, alternatives exist and are being practiced. And I do believe that, uh, again, you put it in a very uh, politely in terms of you know, the, the sort of social cohesion. I would argue it's more than social cohesion, it's political cohesion as well. So political cohesion, is something that is, I would be, I would argue, it's it's not just cohesion. It is, um, it's political, uh, not even stability. It's the ability of the political economy to withstand these different shocks, some of which we know are coming, and some of which we we still don't know yet. And that ability depends on the fact that India is very much a federal uh, country still, and that therefore those different elements of that federal country could, could still emerge to actually create a different future for us. Not a depressing one, but a more optimistic one. Well, thank you, Jayati. Um, you know, the danger with uh, embarking on uh, approaching a large topic such as the one for today's webinar is that, you know, there's, uh, there's so many different uh, layers to peel and uh, but the mood actually is uh, in some ways has gone from uh, anxiety to uh, even deeper anxiety if I if I if I, if I read the message correctly uh, uh, but let's uh, leave uh, some uh, elements for discussion but move straight to Shekhar to check what his mood is on this topic okay Shekhar over to you thank you Gaurav uh, and uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Jati and Arvind, and thank you to CDS for <clears throat> hosting this. Um, really, it's very hard to disagree with uh, Arvind uh, and Jati's uh, assessment, uh, gloomy with some lights of hope uh, as well. Um, what I'll do is uh, pick a little bit from what's been said and maybe add a few more perspectives to both uh, the sense of uh, despondency, but also potentially some rays of hope, which uh, if we get things done right, might uh, still continue to help us. Um, the first thing I want to recognize is that uh, the, uh, the recent past shows us that there were really only two periods of of high growth uh, in the 2000s, uh, the 2003 to 2007 uh, burst of rapid growth with the global economy on steroids and essentially export led completely. Uh, and then during 2014 19, when the falling and low price of oil uh, gave everybody a tremendous boost. Um, both these uh, episodes have been very well researched by papers by Sajid Chinoy and Toshi Jain, uh, indeed in the India Policy Forum that you referred to, Gaurav, uh, that I had the pleasure of uh, sponsoring for a while. Um, uh, what's important about these two high growth episodes is 
the uh, the fact that they were both driven by external developments. Uh, and uh, I want to come back to that uh, uh, in looking at the future and both the sort of short to medium term future, but also the uh, longer term future. Um, just in terms of what the pandemic did, uh, it really revealed just so many fault lines in our country, uh, society, as well as economy. Uh, it, uh, you know, the, the failures that we are all familiar with and have been spoken of, the fact that uh, we suffer from high school education for all not being there, basic health uh, for all uh, not uh, still available after 75 years, and of course, productive and remunerative jobs for uh, for all. Um, <clears throat> I think they've all contributed to India's growing inequality between rich and poor households. And I think as increasingly we are seeing between rich and poor regions. And I'll come back to, to this inequality and what that uh, poses as challenges for us uh, in thinking about the future. Um, the pandemic really highlighted the patchy state of both public and private health. Uh, the lockdowns emphasized the lost learning and the difficulty of remedial education that will allow these students to catch up. Uh, and then the uh, urban to rural migration that highlighted the sharp uh, informality divide in our workforce. So these are things that really uh, now confront us uh, and have become very prominent in the thinking about what our future uh, poses for us. They obviously do not portend well for the, for the future. Um, Arvind started out by uh, asking the question of uh, why is there this uh, uh, great uh, fondness for India and the great uh, uh, attention to India's future. And it's, of course, very enticing to, to do that. Uh, it's also very easy to do that, given that uh, we've got a very large country that is expected to be one of the fastest growing countries uh, relative to others. India reached uh, uh, its middle income status, I think, in 2007, so some 15 years back. Uh, and it uh, is the world's third largest economy in PPP terms and fifth largest in nominal terms now. Um, so the question really is, what will it take for it to uh, get to uh, uh, upper middle income status using the World Bank's uh, definitions uh, uh, well before, of course, it reaches a uh, high income uh, status? The challenges really are quite extreme, just a back of the envelope arithmetic calculation would show us that um, India's PPP per capita currently is about 7,300, uh, which is less than half of China's in 2021, uh, and about a seventh of the OECD average. So to reach that OECD average uh, in the next 25 years, would require India to grow at 8%, the GDP to grow at 8% per year consistently for 25 years. Uh, and uh, if we were to try to catch up with the OECD average in 25 years, that would require something well above a 12% growth rate. Uh, so these are the kind of challenges that just pure arithmetic would uh, tell us uh, need to be addressed in our aspirations to become an upper middle income and thereafter a high income country. Um, against this, the challenges of the demography of India, which is both a great potential, but also the possibility of a serious problem uh, with more than 62% of our uh, population in the 15 to 59 working age group and more than 54% below 25 years of age. So I often turn this perspective of the demographic dividend around and ask the question, will India get rich before it gets old? Uh, because we certainly will be uh, the largest older population or senior population at some point in our, uh, in our trajectory, uh, which will require tremendous fiscal uh, and welfare resources to be able to look after that senior citizen population. Um, the growing inequality that I referred to earlier doesn't help here. Um, 
both between households and states. Um, there's just astonishing diversity that has emerged in the last five to seven years, uh, with some states in the Indian Union in solid middle income status like Haryana and, and, and Tamil Nadu, not to talk about West India. Uh, others like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh uh, would be amongst the world's poorest countries if they were independent. This means that India confronts problems that are not just characteristically low income country problems, but it will also soon be facing and may already be facing problems that bedevil middle income countries and the kind of middle income trap that sometimes these countries fall into. So India is going to have to have a dual challenge of both addressing the low income trap issues uh, of poverty and uh, inability to create opportunity that's inclusive and that's particularly inclusive of women as, as Jayati has been pointing out, uh, but also the middle income uh, problems and middle income trap issues that confront uh, societies which get stuck uh, when there isn't enough innovation, there isn't enough productivity left uh, once it graduates from low wage income type of employment and manufacturing. So the real question to me is how does India escape both these things at the same time, which requires tremendous uh, flexibility of policy, tremendous kinds of software that uh, Arvind referred to. Um, <clears throat> there are two uh, areas that I want to refer to just in the in the time that I have, which uh, do show promise. Um, one relates to a problem, of course, that we all are increasingly aware of and increasingly concerned about climate change. And there, <clears throat> through uh, uh, a variety of private sector and other initiatives, including now federal uh, central guarantees, uh, we're seeing a growth in green energy uh, that is quite uh, dramatic in India. Uh, that has lots of implications. Uh, it obviously would uh, reduce our dependency on fossil fuels and therefore uh, improve our current account deficit. It would reduce pollution and therefore the kinds of deaths that Lancet has uh, estimated a million deaths a year uh, due to uh, air quality uh, issues. And of course, it reduces the cost of power, which then improves our competitiveness uh, in export and domestic markets. So I think that uh, area of uh, growth, I think the uh, economist has called it the second green revolution in India. If that transpires, and there are lots of ifs, because uh, in moving from the target of 150 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy that we currently are producing to the kind of target that uh, Prime Minister Modi has set at uh, COP26 and, and subsequent conversations uh, of moving to 500 gigawatts means a three times expansion of that uh, capacity. Our current generating capacity all uh, means of uh, capacity generation, including fossil fuels is about 400 gigawatts. So that's a very substantial kind of doubling of uh, the grid capacity in India, uh, which is going to require tremendous financial uh, resources. Uh, the estimates are roughly around 500 billion uh, over the course of the next uh, five, seven years. Uh, the targets are set for 2030. Uh, by Mr. Modi. And of course, we have a net zero target of 2070. So these are difficult targets. Um, there are uh, tremendous private sector uh, interests, uh, some of the kind that uh, uh, Arvind and Jyoti referred to, uh, but certainly they are happening. Uh, there are also smaller firms that are innovating uh, in this area. Uh, so it's not just limited to the majors, the Tatas, the Adanis, and the Ambanis, but also uh, I believe there's a fair amount of innovation that's going on. So I think this holds the hope of both addressing climate change issues, which have certainly come to the fore like they've never before this year with the floods in Pakistan and the heat waves in India. Um, this holds the promise of potential 
uh, growth uh, that could be uh, certainly addressing one part of the growth jobs challenge that India faces. I'm not so sure about the jobs challenge and the implications of uh, creating jobs through this kind of greening of the economy, but certainly it will help greatly in terms of uh, addressing uh, many of the other issues that have been mentioned. Um, the other area uh, that I think is worth thinking about, and it goes back to what uh, Arvind talked about, the wiring of India, uh, and of course that's taken uh, on the shape of the new welfareism that he's also talked about with the direct uh, uh, delivery of uh, private uh, goods to households, which is in a sense the way in which uh, the uh, uh, political system has garnered or has, has uh, provided for the electoral support that it needs. Uh, but apart from that, that wiring and the payments mechanisms has created a national market. The, the unification of the market through the GST and other means, I think is an important element in potentially going forward. Uh, if we are able to create the conditions under which uh, the, the states that are lagging can actually uh, do more catch up uh, with the kind of involvement uh, of the digital wiring as well as the unification of markets that is happening uh, through e-commerce and other means. So I see that as an area that has uh, positive potential for handling uh, our problems. So. The challenges going forward in even these two areas are the ones that we are already familiar with. Um, and they are certainly not uh, the ones that are easy to address. Uh, most critically, they're going to require tremendous state capacity, uh, state capacity in, in design, in, in regulation, uh, in monitoring, testing, and piloting in uh, promoting community participation, uh, and ultimately, of course, in promoting accountability. Um, in some ways, uh, the kind of hard infrastructure that uh, uh, Arvind referred to and the success in, in attaining that hard infrastructure, if only Mr. Nitin Gadkari could repeat the performance that he has shown in highway construction uh, in providing uh, health, education, and other services, that would be a tremendous leap forward. But we seem not to be able to address these key foundational issues in human infrastructure uh, in the same way that we've been able to do in the physical infrastructure area. So let me stop here and, and, and turn to the discussion and to a dialogue between uh, us and the uh, participants in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, Shekhar, for um, <coughs> excuse me for for your uh, comments and in particular highlighting um, uh, the issue on in terms of the uh, both the challenge and the opportunities associated with the uh, uh, with climate change and and and, and the environment uh, issues in India. Um, so actually, the, what I might do is I, um, there are a couple of questions and, uh, that we have received. So uh, plus, you know, I might use my my prerogative to to try and uh, pose a couple of questions, but uh, essentially with a view to give uh, you an opportunity to come back uh, and respond to perhaps some of the things that, that you all have uh, mentioned to respond to each other as well. So, I mean, one could pick up uh, many threads. And in fact, one of the questions we have received is the one that, uh, Shekhar, you touched upon, which is uh, the aspect of inequality in, in terms of, uh, in spatial or regional terms. And so I guess, you know, the, 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 the kind of, I mean, this is a feature we have known for a long time. I mean, you know, this is not new. Um, even periods of low growth, there was this tremendous uh, regional differentiation. So the question, really, the deeper question there is, is this a useful lens to, the, is the regional lens a useful lens through which to view economic policy issues? I mean, there is undeniably a regional dimension, but, uh, but the, 
I mean, in some ways, it links up with the issue of uh, labor absorption, et cetera, that Jyoti raised as well. I mean, we, we uh, I mean, although our migration data don't quite pick it up, but there is an evidence certainly of labor mobility. In fact, uh, the reverse mobility in the pandemic highlighted, in fact, that there is actually a lot more mobility than perhaps people uh, recognize. So, and it's the old debate, you know, do you get uh, jobs to the people or people to the jobs, you know, so uh, to where the jobs are. So uh, from that perspective, so one kind of set of questions is really around, is the regional perspective a useful lens for economic policy and thinking about economic policy going forward? Let me pose one or two others and I'll, I'll have to stop because there's not enough time. The other set of issues is really on the distributional side. So, you know, I mean, We've kind of know the uh, broad parameters of the growth story and very nicely laid out by Arvind and also uh, others. Uh, so the the uh, and right now, of course, we we are unsure whether even the success we've had with economic growth can be uh, can be uh, we can we can uh, regain that level of success. And Jayati raises some issues about you know the the distributional angle in some ways, and raising one fundamental issue, in which actually would be good to get Arvind's comment as well, is is uh, the is the deficiency of domestic demand uh, a constraint on growth, um, and you know clearly Jayati made the point that it is, and it would be good to get uh, people's uh, perspective, and it links up with some of the things that Arvind also spoke about in terms of opportunities that at one level, you know, there is this opportunity, the positive side of his uh, discussion was in terms of China vacating a certain space due to a lot of structural slowdown of the Chinese economy, which is probably going to, is going to be there to stay along with other things, you know, the COVID, strict COVID policy. And let's not go into the details of that, but so what that suggests is that this opportunity lies on the on on sort of vacating the vacated space whether we can actually capture that essentially relying on external demand so is is the domestic demand issue a really an important one i mean evidently it does link up with the discussion on inequality uh, and, and i think there's ample evidence actually and all of you have alluded to that that um, you know, poverty has been going down, although there's this debate about how much it has gone down or not, but certainly inequality has been on the rise. So I think there's a, a fair bit of evidence on that. So the issue is really, you know, are, are we trying to reclaim? And it, sorry, I'm taking a bit long, but I'll stop very soon. <laughs> are we trying to reclaim sort of the kind of growth we had? I mean, which was like growth with redistribution, with this growth of new welfare state. There was inequality, but it was tempered. The impact of that inequality got tempered to some extent. And actually, to some extent, I think it's it's not entirely verified, but to some extent got tempered by this new welfareism that Erwin talked about. So are we trying to reclaim that, that kind of growth model, growth with redistribution, or we need to think in terms of redistributive growth, which links up with another theme that Erwin also raised in terms of, you know, comparative advantage in terms of, you know, the, the jobs challenge, low cost, uh, uh, labor intensive kind of forms of development, increasing labor absorption into at a higher level productivity. So let me just leave these a few kind of thoughts and but feel free to go in any direction. Maybe we'll, um, maybe, maybe uh, I think we'll go back to you first, if, if that's all right. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, really great uh, comments by both Jayati and Shekhar, uh, touching upon, uh, you know, a number of very, very important issues. Um, uh, I, I mean, and, and then Gaurav, you've posed a new, a new set of questions. Um, you know, I, I don't want to ramble. I want to be a bit sharp so that everyone can, can uh, has a chance to weigh in. Uh, let me begin just a little bit by taking a little bit of issue with Jyoti in that completely agree on structural transformation, but slightly disagree on whether that's what led to the neglect of human capital. I, I, I think my view is a little bit more that, you know, uh, you know, casteist, hierarchical, you know, this is the kind of Myron Weiner view of health and of education in India, 
that I think they were both sins. I, I don't think one was derivative of the other. Uh, and I think that, and we see that because, you know, both have persisted over time. And uh, so, so that's a small, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to quibble because I think we have to recognize the human capital problem for the, for the you know, unadulterated sin, uh, independent sin that it was, uh, as opposed to being derivative of that. So that's a, a, a small uh, uh, kind of distinction. So, so let me touch upon the, the regional stuff. So, 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 okay, I'll say two things. One is that when we think today about, uh, you know, distribution, redistribution, inequality, the, the kind of analytical framework we, that we now use is, you know, inequality that comes about what we call pre-distribution and post-distribution, i.e. what is the, you know, market outcome and then how do we correct that market outcome? And you can have a thing. And there's no doubt that, you know, all that the new welfareism, et cetera, the social safety net uh, are all part of the post uh, market outcome. And it's clear that, you know, really the only way to address uh, the pre, I mean, a, it's very important to address the pre-distribution part. And, uh, you know, the, the, the only way to do that uh, as Jayati also rightly noted is really uh, employment opportunities in, you know, reasonably formal, higher value added sectors, uh, across all the cleavages that India has, you know, caste, gender, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, so, so, uh, because unless you get the employment, the pre-distribution side, right, it's going to be an uphill battle to make up for that uh, in the post-distribution state. And especially with the fiscal and the ability to do that being limited. So I think we have to focus. But th for, for me, therefore, that that means that, you know, our growth pattern has to be based on our uh, comparative advantage, labor, female labor. Therefore, it has to be have, cannot just be based on domestic demand. It has to be based also on external demand. It's just that uh, our, uh, you know, external, uh, you know, the way we've uh, re responded to external demand is, you know, through high skill services, high skill manufacturing. Uh, so to me, uh, it cannot be just domestic demand as a way of getting that employment opportunities. We have to have. That's why, you know, uh, I want to reclaim for India. I don't know whether it's possible or not, you know, labor intensive. Uh, you know, Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, classic examples of not just, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing the structural transfer by doing this, but also the case of Bangladesh, you know, clothing was all about women's clothes, uh, women's employment and, and, and all the benefits that came that, you know, delayed fertility, more school attendance, more independence, more agency. So, so, so it can't be just based on domestic demand. It has to be based on uh, uh, all kinds of labor intensive uh, and employment opportunities. On the regional stuff, uh, you know, I, I can go on and on. I just want to flag uh, one thing. I, I think, Gaurav, I think my understanding, uh, maybe I'm wrong on this, 1950 to 1980, the period of slow growth, uh, wasn't the period of divergence across states. It's when growth took off. Uh, that divergence across states, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, increased uh, dramatically. Uh, why that is, see, see, remember, the puzzle about India, and this is something I raised in one of the economic surveys, is that why is it that despite there being free mobility of capital, and as we've discovered, labor and goods, which, which should be equalizing tendencies, have we had such divergence within India? Because after all, uh, the, the original, I mean, model was that, you know, capital came to, from rich to poor, and that's how you got convergence. I mean, that applies in spades within a, a market that is as open as India is. Why didn't that happen? It's kind of, to me, a, still a, a puzzle, which I, I have some explanations and hypotheses, but that's something that I think we need to focus on. The last thing I'll say about that, with a lot to say, is that, kind of, uh, you know, just building on what Jayati said at the end. See, I think that the, 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 one of the ticking time bombs politically is uh, the delimitation that's going to happen in 2026. You know, we already see 
uh, one, the divergence between political power and economic, uh, 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 you know, advancement. You know, the southern states are saying, you know, when you when you change this, uh, you know, the the poor populous north is uh, is going to be rewarded for you know its underperformance, and we the south are going to be penalized for our performance. So uh, uh, that's one wedge that's opening up, and the second wedge that's opening up is is. Uh, uh, the other part, which is the southern states and the and the richer states, are saying, you know, we are re re we are actually subsidizing the northern states via all these transfers, via the uh, the finance commission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I've actually done a lot of work, uh, which is you know going to be in some uh, in the book that Devesh Kapoor and I are writing, about how you know uh, how much transfers take place from uh, richer states to poorer states. Now. Obviously, there should be some redistribution. I mean, we all want in India that, you know, there's equalizing forces. But beyond the point, it's not politically sustainable, especially if economic power and political power are going to diverge as a result. So I think that unless we manage this, uh, so, so, so it's not just about centralization of resources, which I think is an issue. It's also about the allocation of resources across states you know that's the regional dimension that is a ticking time bomb in india so the wedge between economic and political power and the wedge between you know uh, the fact that we're into uh, you know to be very blunt about it india is becoming uh, an open ended uh, fiscal transfer state from a fixed set of uh, donors to a fixed set of beneficiaries that and rising distribution, which is not politically sustainable over time. Thanks, Sarvin. Uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we're short on time, but uh, we won't go without uh, uh, giving our other panelists a chance to respond. So uh, maybe uh, we'll go in the same order we began with. So Jayati, over to you. Thank you, and, I, and I'll try to be brief. I completely agree with you, Arvind. I, I mentioned uh, caste and, and you know, the Wiener kind of argument as a factor, and I do definitely agree that uh, that's a critical reason for our denial of basic health and education services to most of our people. So I, I, I'm completely with you on that. On the issue of domestic demand, okay, it's not just domestic demand, but you can't do without it. I mean, you know, so I think the problem here is that we, we think we can start exporting when, when in fact, unable to even sell that commodity domestically. And surely, whether you're thinking about economies of scale or you're thinking about many other issues, I mean, we can't ignore the need to ensure domestic demand. And I think that's been a big problem in the recent trajectory that we forget about mass demand and we assume that we can live off the top 100 million and some exports. I, I don't think that strategy would work either. So, uh, Jethika, on the welfare is, yeah. Jethika, can I, just, just to clarify, maybe just a definitional thing. You see, uh, and this is something that I want to understand, but, but for me, if you address the pre-distribution via, you know, jobs uh, for, uh, you know, uh, the vast thing, that's the way you increase income and demand. So. It's the pre-distribution that's to me critical. And how you get the pre-distribution? I mean, uh, you know, you have a global market, you have a domestic market, let's serve it all. But but it's the it's who gets the jobs and how many jobs you provide that's going to then determine the composition of demand as well. I, I don't disagree. What I'm saying is that that pre-distribution also depends on domestic demand. In other words, you can, you can get a lot of labor intensive employment just to cater to the needs of the domestic market in addition to the foreign market. So pre-distribution itself will require domestic demand is, is the point that you can't do without it in a sense. Um, yeah, on, on the, the welfareist point, yeah, I think Arvind is right, but you know, if you look at it in, in global terms, we are really bad in terms of redistribution. We, we don't, we are not a welfare state in terms of, you know, the difference between the primary and secondary income distribution. Uh, we're way behind other middle income countries, lower middle income countries. So we're not in that sense, that, that good on redistribution. There are some states that are, I mean, 
Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, those are really welfare states. We can argue that it's too much state transfer there, but those are welfare states. The, in, the government of India is not. If you look at it in comparative terms, we're way behind in terms of redistribution. And on that note, finally, last point I'll make, I noticed there was a question on wealth tax. And I do think that the inability we have displayed to tax the rich or to tax corporations as they should be taxed has been a major factor because certainly it's not just about you know tax justice and redistribution. It's also about the ability of the state to meet the basic needs and provide essential services. And if you're not going to tax the rich, if you're not going to tax large corporations and allow them to have effective tax rates of 8%, if you don't have a wealth tax, if you don't have an inheritance tax, then you're not going to be able to raise those resources. So I think uh, the taxation issue is a critical part, not just of fiscal justice and distribution, but it's a critical part of ensuring the development project as well. And I emphasize a wealth tax, it, it's, it's there, it's available, it's necessary uh, to, to be implemented. Thanks, Jayati. Um, yeah, we'll give the last word to, to Shekhar, uh, well, who's, uh, I think, you know, probably best place to find some middle ground, you know, as, as <laughs> and, 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 and um, Perhaps uh, offer us uh, some concluding observations. Over to Sheikh. Well, just just to want to buttress the serious problem that Arvind has alluded to, which is that of fiscal transfers, and we've done some calculations that show that uh, the <coughs> average Indian in Maharashtra pays about twenty thousand in taxes to the center, and the average person in Bihar pays two thousand. Um, and if you put it differently, um, after taking into account the center's transfers uh, into the states, this implies that the average Bihari receives about 600 rupees for every 100 rupees they put into the center, uh, and the average Gujarati resident receives 42 rupees. So you can see that this is not a sustainable situation, especially with the kind of multi-party governments where you do not have one single government uh, at the top that controls the majority of the states. And the, 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 the divergence between economic and political power is going to have a huge role in how to manage this fiscal federalism. Um, and, and that goes back also to the middle income trap, low income trap issues that will confront because the priorities of these states are changing very rapidly without, there, there, instead of convergence, there's actually divergence in their policy priorities that they are dealing with. I want to come back to one thing that I meant to mention but didn't, which is that um, with all what we are thinking about as internal issues, uh, there is a, what Adam Toos has called at Columbia, a, a polycrisis confronting us around the world uh, with the kind of monetary tightening uh, across the board in almost every country that hasn't been seen in the past. Um, and I sense that there is a unwillingness to accept the connectedness of the Indian economy to the outside world and the impact that this is going to have uh, not just in the uh, sort of 2022, 23, but perhaps even for the next few years, and how this is going to be managed within India. And I was struck very much by that one dissenting note in the um, in the minutes of the last Monetary Policy Committee report, where one of the members actually said uh, that uh, monetary policy must only focus on domestic growth uh, inflation dynamics and not on external considerations. And the view was put forward because that's what the law asks us to do. <laughs> we, we know that that just doesn't work. Uh, and you cannot possibly leave uh, the management of external balance to just the foreign exchange market, um, especially when you're still managing that forex market as well. Uh, because of pressures, political pressures and other pressures from within. So I think there is perhaps much more needs to be done internally uh, in Mumbai, in Delhi, uh, in thinking about how to manage this poly crisis going forward. I'll stop there. Thank you, Shekhar. Um, 
we are we are actually uh, have been out of time for a few minutes already. Um, uh, so if if any of uh, our uh, a panel, you know, if you have any burning last minute things that you would like to get across, I don't, I would certainly uh, invite you to do that at this time. Uh, if not, uh, then we might try to uh, bring our proceedings to a close for now. Uh, because you know some of these discussions are not you know, there's no no clear end point in any case because there are the continuing discussions in a evolving kind of uh, situation as well and um, I certainly you know it's beyond my pay grade to try and summarize or con uh, the discussion uh, but and Gaurav, uh, we should be conscious that it's past one o'clock for our yes uh, and it's past one a.m. for, uh, for uh, Arvind and Jayati. And so, profuse set of thanks from my side. So, with that, uh, you know, let me just pass this on to uh, uh, to our director Asad uh, Islam to just offer a word of thanks. But my personal thanks for a, a thoroughly stimulating and enjoyable and thought provoking uh, uh, discussion and and your uh, inputs into that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the CDS, I would like to thank. Uh, our speakers, uh, Arvind Subramanian and Jayati Ghosh and Shekhar Shah, thank you so much. We have learned a lot from you. Uh, we'll keep in touch uh, with you. And thank you for our participants. Uh, our next webinar is uh, next week, uh, Thursday, around this time, uh, 4, uh, 4 o'clock in Melbourne. Uh, I hope to see you all. Uh, with this note, thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.